name is Marcus O'Brien Fair. I am Councillor John Fillion's Chief of Staff, and I will be your host for this evening's discussion, the second in this spring's Let's Talk Willowdale series. Uh, tonight, we are going to be discussing affordable housing in the City of Toronto and looking forward to a wonderful conversation with our panel and uh, all of you that have joined in. Before we get underway, we wish to acknowledge the land that we are meeting on, even if virtually, is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Joining us tonight, we have a a really incredible panel uh, for this discussion, uh, starting with our city councillor for Willowdale Ward 18, John Fillion. We have joining us the City of Toronto's Housing Secretariat, Abby Bond. And we have a manager of policy in the Strategic Initiatives Policy and Analysis Unit of Toronto City Planning, Deanna Chorney. I hope I got that title right. Uh, There's a lot of uh, a lot of bits, uh, and I wasn't sure that uh, anybody would know the SEPA acronym, but uh, uh, both very important players in uh, the city's ongoing efforts to deliver more affordable housing on on various levels, and we're going to be talking more about that tonight. Uh, also in the background with us tonight are Carol Kim and Catherine LeBlanc Miller. Catherine works with John directly on a number of planning issues uh, and, and other community issues. And Carol uh, will be interacting with many of you if you have questions uh, that you would like to ask the panel as we get into this conversation. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a moment. Um, so generally tonight we are tackling the issue of affordable housing and in my experience that can be quite a confusing term uh, because it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It could mean reducing homelessness, it could be increasing amounts of subsidized housing, rent geared to income housing, or just the ability for people making a good living to be able to afford a place to live on the open market. We know for a variety of reasons the Toronto real estate market has surged over the last many years and for quite a lot of us have gone from unaffordable to a full-blown housing affordability crisis. So what's the City of Toronto going to do about it? We're going to dive into that with our panel tonight and look forward to you getting involved and asking your questions as we go. Uh, just want to make sure that everybody is aware we are recording the session tonight, uh, knowing that we are up against uh, a Toronto Maple Leafs playoff game, uh, and we're uh, getting uh, some of our, our loyal participants with us tonight. We will be posting this online so that others can participate after the fact and learn a little bit more about this issue if they are interested. Uh, but for those of you that are with us, you will have an opportunity to participate a little bit later on in the conversation. Uh, if you would like to ask a question of the panel in the right hand side of your screen, you should see a raise hand icon. You can click on that and uh, that will signal to Carol that you have something to ask any of the panelists. There is also a Q&A box on the right hand side of the screen. So if you are feeling a little more shy and, and not necessarily wanting to uh, to speak verbally, you can always punch a question into that Q&A box and we will happily take questions in written form as well. So we have um, some prepared materials, I understand tonight. Normally we ask our, our panelists to, to do a short introduction to the topic that we're discussing. Um, I am going to ask John as the, the counselor and, and host of this evening session to kick things off for a couple of minutes uh, before we go to our other panelists and some of their prepared materials. John? Thanks, Marcus, and a big thank you to Abby and Deanna, because I know they have really busy schedules and are highly in demand, not only during the day, but uh, every evening for this type of um, event that a number of councillors are doing. Um, I think it's fair to say that affordable housing is really issue number one in the city um, this term. Um, I think the mayor has shown a lot of leadership in, in uh, really bringing this to the top of council's agenda. And, um, you know, Marcus and I have been talking about how in the community the it is also 
you know, on the top of everyone's mind. Um, some of us are fortunate enough to have bought a house when um, that was um, affordable, but even those of us who are comfortable have to worry about our children and even, in my case, my uh, granddaughter, you know, are they going to be able to uh, live in Toronto? Um, you know, will, will my kids have to move outside the city um, because they can't uh, afford anything in the city? You know, how, what impact is that going to have on the city's workforce if uh, people can't afford to live here? Um, you know, there's just, um, uh, as Marcus said, there's a lot of aspects to affordability from the crisis and on in people having nowhere to live at all to um you know people with good jobs not being able to um afford the rent or afford um to buy a place so um we hope to explore all of that uh, tonight and um thanks again for being with us i'll toss it back to you marcus thank you john and thanks for uh helping to host this event tonight uh with your team uh, we're all very glad to, to have this conversation with uh, some of the city's foremost experts on affordable housing. Um, I'm going to ask Abby Bond, the city's housing secretariat, to to lead us off. I know she's got some uh, materials and illustrations to help shape the, the first stage of this conversation. So I'll send it over to you, Abby. Uh, thanks very much, Marcus, and thank you for the invitation to be here this evening. I'm just going to, I have a few slides that may help our conversation, um, and hopefully you can see that now. Um, so, I guess I'll start a little bit, just a couple of things that you may not know about Toronto's housing context. I guess the first thing is that actually renter households are almost half of the households who live in the city. Um, so really a high number of renter households. And unfortunately, about one in four of them pay more than 50% of their income on housing. And the challenge with that is if you're spending 50% of your income, then you don't really have enough money for food, transportation, clothing, recreation, all the other things that we need to have good quality of life. So it really compromises your ability to take part in the city and really enjoy the amenities that we provide. The map there on the right is really just illustrating some of the challenges we're facing, some of our renter households are facing. So for a household who's earning $50,000 a year, so that could be somebody who is working in a long-term care facility, working in a shelter, dental assistant, those kinds of jobs, they can only afford to rent a one-bedroom apartment in three neighborhoods right now in Toronto. So the little green pockets that you see on that very, very blue map are what is currently affordable to them. So we need more affordability to help key workers stay and live in our city. What did the city do? We came up with a 10-year plan, which has a target of 40,000 new homes over 10 years. Really comprehensive. I'm not going to go through all of the details. I'm sure there may be questions about that, but it really covers the full spectrum. So from uh, social housing all the way through to market housing, as the councillor said. Uh, one thing I wanted to let you know is um, that 10-year plan is really comprehensive and it will also cost us around $27.7 billion to deliver on those 40,000 40, homes and all of the actions in it. Right now, you can see from the chart, the city is kind of leading the charge with um, a commitment of over $7 billion so far towards that overall cost of delivery. And we see the federal government at about 2.1 and the provincial government with less than a billion. So we're really calling on all three levels of government to contribute adequately so that we can fully fund that robust plan. Um, there are really in the plan there are really two kinds of programs. One kind really supports those people who need a long-term subsidy, um, rent geared to income programs, social housing, modular, supportive housing, those kinds of programs. And then there are programs around affordable housing where the city will offer incentives to our partners to build new homes and where we will also build rental housing on our own land. Just a little bit, this is where I think some people get really confused about what is um, affordable housing and there's these two kinds we have rent geared to income or social housing this is where the rent 
is calculated based on your income. So where you pay a rent that's no more than 30% of your income. To apply to that, you will join a wait list. Right now in the city of Toronto, that wait list is around 80,000 households. And then for affordable housing, this is where your um, rent will be linked to the cost of market. And right now we operate lottery system to access that kind of housing. Just a little example of who might, and I know Deanna is going to talk a bit about this later, but who would, who is this kind of housing for? So on the rent geared to income side, you can imagine somebody like a single parent with two children on Ontario work. So their household income is about $7,000 a year. They can afford, afford to pay rent of less than $300 a month. Another example might be a couple over 65, their household income is about 27,000 a year and they can afford to pay just under $700 a month in rent. So the social housing programs for them. And then on the affordable housing side, you've got people, early educators, uh, retired pensioners, construction laborers, and pra practical nurses with incomes between kind of 35 and $50,000 a year. And that's who we really target for affordable housing. Okay, those are my slides. Happy to jump into the conversation. All right, Abby, thank you very much for uh, for all of that information. Um, I'm going to get you to drill down on a couple of those topics for us a little bit, um, just to make sure that we're all um, on the same page and, and understanding um, some of the examples of these programs that are already underway in the city, um, which I think are important for people to know about. Um, so maybe we could start just to, to speak for a moment about residents of the city that might not have any kind of home at all currently, those experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, I think there has been a, a growing challenge throughout the pandemic or, or perhaps a growing awareness for various reasons that, um, you know, this is still an issue gripping our, our city. What are some of the measures that are underway to ensure that everyone has an option to have a stable roof over their head? Yeah, thank you, Mark. It's great. Um, question. Um, one of the it's one of the biggest challenging challenges facing our city. You talked about the housing affordability crisis, and it affects really average people. But um, often, kind of people with average incomes do still have a number of more choices available to them. Unfortunately, we see almost eight thousand people every night living in shelters in the city, um, and they really have very minimal choices. So the city has really tried to pivot to deliver much more housing as a response, and not just building shelters. Um, we feel this will offer people the best route to kind of better health care, better housing outcomes. And so we've been delivering supportive housing across the city. Uh, right now we have about um, seven different sites that we're working on, five of which are modular housing, one of which is in Willowdale, and really trying to get those open as soon as possible, certainly before next winter, so that people who are living outside have a place to come inside for. All right. And would those sorts of programs fall under the rent gear to income umbrella that you were speaking about a moment ago? Yeah, very much so. They even go beyond just what's affordable for rent. And those projects will have those kinds of housing will have staff who also stay on site 24 seven to offer additional supports over and above just offering a, a lower rent. All right. One of the concerns that we sometimes hear from residents about uh, these sorts of, of housing initiatives is the cost and where is the money going to come from? Um, I was very surprised to learn, looking at some of the economics, that it's actually more affordable for the city to build permanent housing than it is to operate shelters. Um, could you touch on that for a moment, uh, just sort of the economics of this and how this is a benefit for, for the city as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. It, it really is. So um, before the pandemic, there certainly was a business case for uh, more housing. Um, but since the pandemic, the cost of delivering shelter actually doubled um, really during the pandemic. And so we see the cost of around, uh, you know, 6000 per bed um, compared to around uh, 4000 for um, supportive housing. So it really it, it is a much better option. Um, not just on the cost side, but actually delivering somebody a home. This is somebody who would then have their own front door they can close, their own bathroom, cooking facilities. It's really going to put people on a much 
better pathway um, to helping them improve their health, um, you know, reconnecting with family, things like that. It's really very difficult to improve your life when living in a shelter when your list, all of your um, communal space is shared with other people. It's very challenging. All right. And you touched on the, the modular supportive housing project in, in Willowdale that uh, you've been working on and the council has been working on and uh, many have been working on, um, but uh, it has been also quite contentious in the community for, for a variety of reasons. How have these projects been received in other parts of the city? Um, you know, have they been successful? Um, how are they integrating with, with the neighborhoods that they've been placed in? Yeah, thanks. So we have two modular um, housing sites which we opened in the last year, um, one at Dover Court and one at Macy Avenue. Um, I'm really well integrated now, but that's not to say the community weren't, some members of the community weren't worried when we first told them we were going to open supportive housing. So I think there are people have lots of questions and are concerns about this type of housing, um, but we're able to work through that with the community and then open it, open both sides so we really haven't seen some of the fears that people were worried about come to fruition um, and actually the communities have been really welcoming um, of the of the people once they moved into the um, neighborhood terrific i'm going to come back to you in a second abby before we move off of that i just wanted to to get john to speak for a moment because he's been a a strong advocate of, of that program really from the outset and, and john i wonder if you could speak for a moment about uh, why it's been so important for you to support the the modular uh, supportive housing initiative that's come forward and uh, you know why why you think it has a place in in our community well I think all parts of the city um, you know have an obligation to help solve uh, what is really a, a, a huge problem imagine eight thousand people with uh, no place to live and um, you know, we have an affluent society. We are caring people, and uh, I think we have an obligation to uh, create permanent homes for as many of those people as we can. And um, it just is is not an okay um, response to say, you know what, I'm all for it, but somewhere else, not uh, you know, not in Willowdale. And it's been unfortunate that we've. Um, we've heard some of that and there's been a whole lot of misinformation and um, um, I'm just looking forward to all of that coming to an end. And um, um, I think uh, th going through the rezoning process, which unfortunately will take longer, but uh, we're going through that. Hopefully um, there'll be a, a decision soon enough that we can um, get homes in place for 59 people before next winter we this past winter we had 59 people um literally out in the cold during an awfully cold winter while we had 59 um homes for them stored in a ttc parking lot so that is just not okay and you know i guess it would be fair to say there would be uh you know that number would be even larger if not for the city's existing stock of of, of social housing um i know you know not so many years ago uh there was a lot of discussion we were getting near crisis state for for many of those units as well buildings having to be shuttered um just so many units in, in a really bad state of, of repair um, Abby, I wonder if you could talk for a moment about the progress that the city's made over the last few years. Uh, you know, my sense is more recently we are are on a better path to uh, restoring a number of those units. Um, could you speak about that for a moment? Yeah, I mean, as you rightly highlight, um, how awful is it in a housing crisis that you have to close existing homes? Um, it's really um, unfortunate that the city came, that that was experienced, uh, but a good thing happened was that the city and TCHC came together and really uh, made the case to the federal government for a partnership approach. And as a result of that, we are seeing about $1.4 billion being invested into those homes so that they can be re-rented, they can be done up, they can be improved and then rented to families and households that really need them. So it's that kind of partnership where 
the city and our partners in that case TCHC but sometimes it's other nonprofits we really come together but it does it's not something the city can really do on our own that's why we rely on the federal government and the provincial government as well to help and and you had shared some numbers in in your presentation in terms of what has come from various levels of government um looking here again 7.1 billion from the city 2.1 billion from the federal government and uh 0.6 billion from the the provincial government uh there are target numbers for all three levels of government in the chart that you shared how how were those targets established um i mean has there been joint agreement across the three levels of government or is there still dispute on whether or not uh all levels of government have a role to play in in addressing these issues I would say I, I don't know that there's a dispute um, as to whether all levels of government should play a part. I'm, I'm not sure there's full agreement exactly how much everybody should contribute. Um, we, the City of Toronto really led with their 10 year plan um, with those ambitious, I think, goals of 40,000 new homes and kind of led um, that conversation and really put it back to the other levels of government to say, look, you really need to join us. This needs to be a fair share by everybody to really deliver on this kind of plan. So that was the goal, is the goal of the City of Toronto is to see um, our investment in land and cash and resources going into these projects matched by the other two levels of government. And I mean, how would you characterize the, um, you know, the, the city's level of involvement to this point? Um, you know, is, is there room for the city to make up some of those gaps if, if other governments aren't stepping up? Uh, and, and maybe I'll get John to weigh in on this as well from the perspective of council. Um, I mean, are we doing all we can at this point? Is there is there room for us to cover other other shortfalls? I'll just say briefly, um, the the ten year plan housing TO was designed to be what we thought um, the measures we thought necessary to really change the way the housing system was responding to the crisis, and we have always been really clear that this cannot just be the city of toronto as a municipal level government we do not have the resources we're not collecting the right kind of tax in the right amount to really respond um, affordable housing may be affordable at the point of delivery but we still need to pay for the construction pay for land these things are expensive um, they require big investments so we've always been really clear that this cannot just be the city on our own and John, what's your take on that from from council's perspective in terms of the finances? Well, I I think we're we're doing everything we can, and I think we're doing it pretty um, generously. And the public is doing it generously because it's uh, the public uh, money we're spending. And as Abby said, like the city is really limited in what money it can collect. I think people don't realize how little we collect with, for example, one percent of property tax increase, I think it's in the neighborhood of $30 million. Um, and when you're when you're talking about expenses that we have that are in the billions for housing, for um, other infrastructure, for public transit, um, you know, for, it, it's just not, it can't come from the property tax base. It needs to really come from other levels of government. Uh, the federal government has been pretty generous. The provincial government seems to have a lot of money to um, give out, give away these days. Uh, perhaps they could hold on to some of that and use it for housing. All right. And Deanna, I'm going to come to you in just a moment. Before we before we do, uh, one more area I wanted to explore with Abby. We, we've uh, Dug a little bit into the um, brink gear to income uh, programs and options. Uh, also, want to touch on the affordable housing programs that are coming online. Things like the Housing Now initiative. Um, these are relatively new programs uh, coming to the city. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how these are, are designed to work? Uh, where are we finding these spaces? Who is going to be responsible for for getting them built, and and who will be overseeing their um, their their delivery? to the public. 
Yeah, um, the Housing Now is one of our most important programs. Um, these are city-owned land uh, that we are choosing to make available for development adjacent to prime transit um, areas of the city. Um, that's where we feel affordable housing should be. It should be close to transit. This will help us not just with affordability, but also with our climate goals as well, to have people living and working um, in, in a, with good connections to those things. So we've put forward 21 sites across the whole city in, in a whole variety of locations and ultimately hope to deliver 10,000 affordable units as a result of that. Uh, we do that by offering the sites um, to the market. So inviting for-profit and non-profit developers to form partnerships to develop that land. And through that, generally, we're able to get a mix of about one third affordable housing, one third market rental and one third condominium. In some cases, we're able to increase that to kind of 50% affordable housing and 50% rental. But generally, we're looking for mixed income um, developments. And in addition to the housing, many of the sites also include things like daycares, community spaces as well. So they're not just mixed income, but they're complete communities in their own right. So it's really important. We've uh, been really successful at um, getting the interest from partners to develop those sites. And yeah, just really trying to get um, as much development done under that program as possible. Okay. And you had a few examples of income levels in your slides, but um, I mean, roughly speaking, up to what kind of household income level would we be talking about uh, being eligible for, for that type of program? Well, I might, I might let Deanna talk about some of the um, income levels because we've actually just gone through a process of changing our approach um, from a uh, market rent approach to an uh, household income approach. So it might be good to, to, we can come back to that question maybe when she shared some of her information, might be easier. Okay, well, uh, Dana, it sounds like the, the spotlight has just been turned in your direction. Um, I am going to turn things over to you um, to introduce us to some concepts, uh, uh, some other concepts of, of how to deliver housing more affordably in the city of Toronto. Wonderful. So I just have a few slides and really just kind of want to talk through some of the policy levers that we're, we're working on with that we've advanced, particularly um, city planning and in partnership with the Housing Secretariat. So I'll just share my screen here. And okay, so you should all see that. Okay. Um, okay, so, you know, just to start off, I mean, certainly we know housing affordability and house prices, it's a complex system. There's not any one policy tool or program tool that is going to, you know, quote unquote, fix um, the housing market. And so one of the things that we've been advancing through city planning is what's called inclusionary zoning. Inclusionary zoning is a very technical term, but really what it means is we're going to require developers to provide affordable housing in, in their new developments. Um, so it's, it's not a negotiated piece. It's different than Section 37. It's really about setting a kind of, you know, consistent bar across all new developments, particularly around transit stations, saying this is the expectation for affordable housing. As part of this work, we did a lot of market analysis. Um, we hired consultants to, to really help us understand um, market and what was feasible in terms of providing that affordable housing. So I sort of just included this slide to think about all those different pieces that are factoring in both on the demand and supply side. Um, and, and just to let you know how much we, we really had to look at a particular round cost of construction, um, you know, labor availability and so on. All of those pieces are really critical in terms of making sure we have a right and balanced housing supply. Uh, so this is a, a snapshot in terms of where inclusionary zoning will apply in the city. We've identified three different what we're calling IZ for inclusionary zoning market areas. Uh, so dark blue, that kind of mid blue, and a light blue. And then those yellow dots on this map are all the different transit stations where inclusionary zoning would apply to. Um, so generally speaking, when the city looks at those yellow dots, we say it needs to be about a 10 or 15 minute walk. And within that area, new developments would um, have an affordable housing requirement. 
you can see in Willowdale, it's sort of in that lightest blue. And part of that was when we did the work, there was a number of different market indicators that made us a bit cautious about applying a, a higher set aside. Um, so we are reviewing that in the context of, you know, um, new density permissions, construction costs, so on and so forth. And I expect that, um, you know, if there are changes, we'll be reporting those out to council. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to note here is that all of these yellow dots require the Minister of Municipal Affairs to approve what's called the Protected Nature Transit Station Area. So the province added in this additional layer um, of kind of review, and part of that was they wanted to see that we were going to be providing enough density permissions in these areas uh, to make sure that we could keep up with growth. So the city's been advancing these. To, uh, to date, Council's approved 18 protected major transit station areas in the downtown and then a couple um, along Keel Finch. And then we're continuing to advance um, a number of others. I think 97 have gone out for consultation in addition to those 18. But it does mean it's an additional step before we can start implementing inclusionary zoning. Uh, so, you know, certainly Abby talked about all the different program pieces and inclusionary zoning, one policy tool, it's not going to, you know, fix the city's affordable housing crisis. Um, what we're showing here is really fairly modest um, percentages of affordable housing that would be required to be included in new developments. Uh, so you can see, for instance, in 2022, we're saying that if you're in the downtown, you'd have to provide 7% of your residential growth floor area, so the, the total residential in the building as affordable housing. And if you were providing affordable ownership instead of affordable rental housing, you'd have to provide 10% of that. So again, a modest step. We are looking to increase those over time as, as the market gets used to this, as developers get more used to this tool. Uh, but it certainly is, isn't meant to, to kind of cure everything. And we know that where new, you know, other cities have implemented inclusionary zoning, it's sort of grown over time, right? So it really is about getting used to this new tool and making sure that we're not negatively impacting overall supply. So one of the other big moves that we brought forward in addition to inclusionary zoning is, as, as Abby was speaking about and, and Marcus, you referenced as well, was our new definition of affordable housing. So historically, affordable rental housing has really been tied to what we call average market rent. So average market rent is, um, you know, if you look at all the rental units in the city, so units that someone's lived in for 25 years or a unit that has just turned over and, and uh, you know, university student has just rented, if you look at all of those and you, you look at the average rent by each bedroom type, that's what you come up with for average market rent. And historically, that was something that was sort of more within reach of people who had low and moderate incomes. What we've seen over, you know, particularly over the last five years, but even the five to 10 years, is those average market rents have really started to escalate as dramatic increases. So, you know, I think we saw, um, you know, a 7% increase to average market rents one year. And, and what that meant is that increasingly they're out of reach and, and sort of um, out of touch with that low and moderate household income. Um, so when we think about wanting to support key workers in the city, our essential workers, and make sure that, you know, the ECE worker can afford to live in their community and also provide, you know, good quality childcare and so on, um, the registered nurse and all of those things. We knew we had to look at our definition of affordable rental housing and affordable ownership and start thinking about when we're setting those, how do they reflect the actual incomes in our city rather than just sort of, you know, quote unquote, chasing the market. Um, so this is different than rent geared to income housing, meaning that an individual household isn't going to pay a certain percentage of their income towards housing. Instead, we're taking those incomes and then we're translating that into annual rents or annual prices. Uh, so you can see on this chart what this means is that a security guard, for instance, uh, would be paying a rent of about um, $812 a month for a studio unit. So a security guard making just over $33,000. Um, Similarly, you can see that a family, a registered nurse with a child, um, they would be paying for a two-bedroom about $1,661. Um, and an ECE and a bank clerk who are renting a three-bedroom would be paying just over $1,800 for an affordable rental unit. Um, and when you kind of look at what asking rents are for new rental units, 
these are significantly below. So asking rents last year for a three bedroom unit were over $2,500. And I know, you know, anecdotally talking to people who are looking for housing, that, that's a good deal, right? People are really struggling to find even a $2,500 new rental unit. So part of the, the work we did is really to make sure that going forward, um, that those rents do reflect our household income. Um, I would say that, so council approved this definition last, um, I guess last November, it has been appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal uh, and, you know, we're still working through those, those site specific appeals and the, the appeals overall. I'm optimistic, but we know that it takes a long time once these matters are at the tribunal. So um, timing is still wait and see. Uh, so with that, I guess I'll, I'll stop sharing. That's great, Deanna. Thank, thanks for that. Um, so am I understanding then correctly that the inclusionary zoning program that the city is trying to bring in would be a tool to create more of the uh, affordable housing uh, types that Abby was talking about that uh, would currently be assigned by by a draw to to applicants? Is that what we're talking about in this case as well? That's right, and I think, you know, Abby could speak a little bit about the work they're doing around housing access system. Um, so really making sure that if you're looking for affordable housing or if you're looking for social housing, there's sort of a one window portal that you're accessing through the city. Um, and I think in terms of making sure that whether it's through random draw or there's other eligibility criteria, it's making sure that, that those units go to households who really need it and that there's a transparent system in place. Abby, right. did I get it, all of that right? <laughs> That was great, actually. Uh, the only thing I would add is that Council have asked us to do some more work and report back on that in um, June, in, later in the summer. Uh, we've got some more work to do as staff, um, and then we'll be bringing back our plans for that one window portal. Um, so there's more, more work to do on this. And I guess uh, I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around, um, you know, approximately what sort of house, household income level uh, would make somebody eligible to to apply for for an affordable housing unit and i guess it would depend a little bit on the size said uh, on the chart that you showed yeah it really depends on you know if you're looking for a, a studio you're a single person um a two-bedroom three-bedroom generally speaking you know if, if you look at the monthly rent your income um if you look at you know your annual income the annual rent, excuse me, um, your income shouldn't be more than four times that annual rent. Okay. Um, we're, we're quickly getting to the point where I do want to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I'm going to tackle one more topic with the panel before we do that. But uh, if you've been listening along, uh, you have a question for Abby, Deanna, John, uh, look for the, the raise hand icon on the right hand side of your screen. And uh, in about uh, five minutes or so, you'll have an opportunity to ask that question live. Uh, if you'd rather, there is a Q&A box on the right hand side. You can type in a question and uh, we can read those questions out for you if you would prefer. Um, before we get there, you know, we've talked about uh, a couple of, of, of different types of housing programs. I think there's another big question, though, that's on the mind of many residents, and that is uh, more of the open market uh, housing options. You want to buy a, a home, you want to buy a condo, um, or perhaps you're not eligible to to apply for, for some of these programs. You're still finding rent very difficult to to afford, um, you know, especially with, with other costs of living sort of skyrocketing all around us. Um, you know, the, the argument has been made out there over and over again that if you just sort of open the floodgates, um, you know, just built a, a whole whack more more housing wherever you can that that with that supply would drive down prices uh and give everybody an opportunity to, to find a place to live um john i know you've taken issue with that uh, maybe I'll, I'll let you start and then throw it over to to abby or deanna to, to comment as well yes and i i wish it were true but um it, it it's not i mean it may it would help i mean obviously the more supply of you have of something, the less scarce something is that um, may have some impact on prices, but um, it's really 
um, a false notion that, frankly, the provincial government has put out that we should be creating all this density in order to create housing supply to make housing more affordable. There are ways to make housing more affordable and the inclusionary zoning, uh, for example, um, will do that around subway stations where there is additional density. So in that instance, it all goes hand in glove. You know, the province wants more density around subway stations. We're happy to give that to them. That represents good planning. And we want to make sure that within that, there are a certain percentage of truly affordable units. But that um, that re still requires provincial approval, by the way, and uh, we haven't had it yet. Um, but the notion that you just let the free market do whatever it wants, um, in my view, um, creates more speculation, which in turn drives up the price of housing. And we have many examples in Willowdale, especially where that kind of activity has occurred, where you'll have somebody do a land assembly, um, they get it redesignated, they end up fighting with the city, going to the Ontario Land Tribunal, or before that, the OMB, getting a whole lot more density approved. They don't build it. They flip it to somebody else. They then come back in and say, we want more density. And, um, you know, I've had that happen time and time again, especially this year. And it doesn't result in any affordable housing. We have somebody right now at uh, at Young and Shepherd that wants to double the number of units and not a square inch of affordable housing in the whole lot of it, you know? So um, it, it's really, you know, not true that just by increasing the supply, you create affordability, you need to increase the supply because we have more people who need homes, but we also have to carve out a portion of that that, actually is affordable. And Abby or, or Deanna, any any take from, from your side on, on that notion? Um I think building building more housing is always going to be a good part of the solution. Um, and the market uh, is in, in many parts of the city is doing a great job about building the condominium supply that people want and need. I think that's where the city at the staff level, we've really tried to focus on um, building supply that wouldn't necessarily be created by the market on its own. So it's about incentivizing through offering our land or through some other kind of financial incentive and also partnership with um, nonprofits to try and um, create more choice so that when we're not just building one kind of housing supply, we're building um, something that everybody can afford so that, you know, the um, grandchildren, children can stay in the city. Um, yeah, so I'd, over to Tiana. Yeah, and I would say, you know, kind of thinking about it from a city planning perspective, I mean, certainly the community planning folks I work with, they're incredibly busy, and you can see we've approved a lot of, you know, housing units particularly condominium units, um, but that doesn't match the number of units that are completed each year. And so part of that is just, I think, a critical issue in terms of trades, right? That we know in terms of the city, there's kind of a certain number of units they can be completing each year, about 15,000 units. Um, and so it goes back to that whole kind of ecosystem and all those impacts on housing prices that it's not just one little thing that, oh, let's just suddenly start approving all these, you know, more developments because there's a lot of other pieces that have to come into play um, before we start seeing those units actually get built and, and people living in them. All right. One more question and then we're going to go to the audience. Um... I guess the, the final question I wanted to ask the the panel just has to do with supports in the community to uh, support the additional housing that we're talking about. Abby, you, you talked about for the Housing Now program, uh, incorporating things like child care. Um, you know, one of the observances I've had in Willowdale over the last many years where we've had a lot of high rise construction happening very, very quickly uh, is there is this tension um, because often the, the community services haven't 
government kept pace with uh, the housing that's come in. And uh, of course, people that are already living in, in neighborhoods uh, get very concerned. Are we going to get overwhelmed? Uh, can I still get my kids into swimming lessons? Uh, can I still, um, you know, find a, a class at the community center? Um, you know, is there enough park space? Is there enough road space? Is there enough transit capacity? Um, you know, as we talk about getting more uh, more housing, more density, um, are there things that the city is doing to look at uh, sort of better matching the services in the neighborhoods that are growing the most quickly? I can start and then Abby certainly can jump in. I mean, I think there's a few things that come to mind. Um, you know, one from kind of just like when we think about how to create mixed income communities and integration, I think those community services are critical, right? I remember talking to tenants in Regent Park who were the social housing um, replacement or revitalization tenants, and they really felt like, you know, they weren't, they were in their own social housing building, but they were meeting their neighbors, their kids were, were making new friends at the aquatic center, you know, at the playground, all of those pieces. There's going to be a big change with Section 37, and, and certainly, you know, we know even with Section 37, we weren't keeping up with that need for all that community infrastructure. Um, you know, by our own estimates, we're going to be collecting less money under what's called the community benefits charge. Um, so where a developer pays a certain amount of money rather than maybe, you know, providing the same negotiated benefits as part of a, an overall discussion with the community. Uh, so I think it's really going to be critical as we start having these new tools. How are we thinking about making sure that, you know, parks, forestry, and recreation has that in their capital budget to know this growth is coming and they can plan for it. A lot of what we do through planning studies is that work. Um, we, we want to make sure that we're, we're identifying those communities early on uh, so that as that growth comes, it's there. Um, but certainly it's a complex process and, and it's not an inexpensive one, right? Those facilities cost a lot of money. Absolutely. Abby, any thoughts on that? I, I'm sure John has a good a good rant on this one. I, I'll, I'll queue up in just a moment. Um, I, I guess I would just say that I've always thought of affordable housing as being part of a complete community and part of city building. And it's always in my mind gone along with all of those other parts of a city or a community that are necessary for for life for living a good life in a place so for me it's never been an either or i think um it's really just been that municipal governments like the city of toronto have perhaps more only recently realized how much they need to do around affordable housing so it's it's almost like the new kid on the block the new thing that now needs to happen and unfortunately it's it's coming at a time when uh, you know municipal financing and the cost of delivering those um city building community goals are getting more expensive so it's definitely a challenging environment to for us all to work in but still uh, including those kinds of spaces and uses in alongside affordable housing i think is remains critical yeah, and I think you, you touched on a on a key point, Abby, is that the you know the everything's becoming more expensive. Uh, you know, we we are, are seeing this imperative of of giving people places to live, but um, you know we don't just want a city made up of concrete blocks where people are living. We want livable neighborhoods. Uh, everybody wants to be proud of the place that they're living with access to to great services. Uh, you know, John, this is a a battle you've been fighting for for decades as the North York Center has evolved and. And trying to to keep pace with uh, with services uh, to the the quickly growing population in the area, um, there have been a lot of of provincial rules that have changed in the last couple of years. So, from your perspective, what's the path forward here? Uh, you know, more housing seems to be an imperative, but at the same time, how do we make that work as a as a complete community? Well, I I think we just need to be able to require developers to create um, or contribute the funds so that the city can create complete communities. I think um, most people are okay with the higher density, um, even higher than the density we've had, as long as you have enough schools, childcare centers, community centers, parks, and a host of other things. And as long as there is some affordable housing 
kicked in. So um, I think that's the the phase we're in now. I give uh, Mel Lastman and community leaders from the 80s and 90s great credit for uh, developing a terrific system in Willowdale whereby you had um, a lot of growth, but the developers had to contribute to the well-being of the community. That's been pretty much wiped out. So the trick is to create some new version of that so that we we do get a really uh, maintain a really strong livable community over the next 20, 30 years. All right, John, thank you. Um, at the moment, I think uh, we have got one question queued up for, for the panel. Uh, hoping those that are uh, participating will have others. So we'll encourage you now, if you do have a question, use the, the raise hand icon or put your question into the Q&A box. And uh, I'm going to ask Carol to, to lead us off. Hey, we have a question within a comment. Um, it goes, it's good to hear about partnership learned today that the United Church is committed to creating more affordable housing. Wondering if there's an opportunity here in Willowdale specifically, given their history with housing here. Maybe a question for John. Um, sure, I don't know if they have a site in mind, but um, the, um, the city did um, put density on most um, church sites when it was developing the North York Center. And um, one church in particular was, was a United Church, uh, Cummer Church, um, built affordable housing. Um, that was something they just decided to take on with the density they had. Um, some other churches have built new churches and, and used the, uh, the value of the density that way, but are in all cases that I know of are using the new church to um, reach out to the community more, including those in need through food banks and out of the cold programs and that sort of thing. So uh, I've always thought there's very much a place for the faith communities who uh, are sitting on a lot of land to um, create various types of housing. And uh, I'd uh, be very happy to work with anybody, as I know. Um, our city staff would be as well. Abby or Deanna, are there examples, uh, other parts of the city where, where that type of model has worked? Um, yeah, very much so. So we're really pleased we have a partnership with the United Church. We actually have a memorandum memorandum of understanding for about 500 units. So um, they're looking at their own sites. They're trying to figure out which ones are the best ones, talking to our planning staff. Um, so not all of the sites, um, you know, are public yet or are going through the process, but they're, I, I think they're doing a really interesting thing, which is um, look to their own land and their own assets to try and find a way to help um, solve the housing crisis and and use their land in a better way. So we're really excited about that kind of partnership. Um, it'll take some years to roll out to do all of the work necessary, but it's really a step in the right direction. Um, and we'd love to have more partners. We'd love to see more churches look at, you know, under, underutilized buildings or parking lots, as well as other organizations, not just uh, churches. I think we're, we're open for business and open for ideas of organizations out there who see affordable housing in their future. Terrific, terrific. Um, I'm not seeing any more uh, questions coming in uh, just yet. So I will throw out one more uh, cry to anybody that's here and, and has a question before we wrap up. Um, I will throw out one more uh, just to give everybody one last opportunity. Um, and that is just to ask all of you if, if there are residents that are um, concerned about this issue, and, and certainly we have a number of them with us tonight. Um, are there things that residents in communities can do to help advance this cause? What can engaged citizens of our city do um, to, to help you doing, to do the work that you're doing uh, to help propel that forward uh, perhaps even more quickly? Do you want me to jump in, Marcus? Quickly? Sure. Why don't you lead off, uh, and uh, right. and Deanna, if she's got any thoughts, and and then John. Um, 
Well, I think being interested in and engaged in your community is, is the first place um, to start, right? I think a lot of us come to some of these issues from from the fact that they, how they affect us personally and in our community. And um, being interested in about this in your community, I think is a good place to begin. Um, as we've talked about, there are many people who have, you know, done well actually in in recent years out of the you know changes in the housing market they they've seen their property prices increase significantly um but i think um educating yourself and understanding how that is just one part of our housing ecosystem and if we're not building different kinds of housing for the future then you might be all right you're going to do very well out of that situation but we're going to lose our ability to be competitive and stay a really good diverse place to live for the next few generations so i think seeing yourself as part of that ecosystem understanding that being prepared to talk to your neighbors your friends your colleagues about that and just being able to you know show up at meetings like this um you know deanna and her colleagues do great work across the city planning out the city and sometimes we just don't hear from the variety of people that we really need to hear hear from. So I would say, um, and just learn the, about the issue, get involved, uh, and show up to have your say when when planning work is happening. Or oh, you were on mute, Marcus. I think. Sorry, my my children were yelling in the other room for a moment, so I, I put myself on mute. Uh, didn't want to scold them in the uh, the final moments here. Um, but to Deanna, um, from your perspective, uh, in, in terms of putting together planning policy, um, what's helpful to you in terms of engaged residents coming forward and, and taking an active role in these discussions? Yeah, and I was going to kind of similar to what Abby was saying. You know, when I joined the city as a planner, and I would go to many different community meetings, you know, all across the city and all different wards. And certainly the question of affordable housing wasn't top of mind. I mean, it was kind of the same as it is now in terms of traffic being the number one concern, but you really very rarely heard folks um, you know, local residents talk about why it was important, what a developer was doing. And I've really seen, you know, a fundamental shift over the last number of years where you see community members showing up at, at consultation meetings and really demanding that the developer, you know, respond to this affordable housing crisis we're in. And I think that's, that's been instrumental. You, you see developers who previously would have been like, no way, no how, um, start to work with us and partner with us. Um, it can still be a struggle. It can still be a challenge, but having those voices and having those, those folks advocate to their local counselor, having them advocate to the developer, having that voice um, as part of the overall audience, I think is critical. And John, any, any perspective from you on resident engagement? Yes, well, I think people really need to get involved. I, I know most of the people on the call tonight are interested from a, you know, social justice or, you know, very human point of view. But just even from a selfish point of view, if we don't create a more affordable city, um, people who have businesses aren't going to be able to have employees. And whether you're or we'll have a lot of difficulty finding employees, whether it's entry level, minimum wage type jobs or highly skilled jobs, you know, um, people need a place to live. And if they can't get them in Toronto, they're not going to be able to stay here and work. And, um, you know, it's just, um, you know, just about every job you can think of, it's really difficult now to live in Toronto. Um, and, and, we have to change that or it, it's going to have consequences for everybody. So this is really an issue that um, regardless of your motivation, you should be paying attention to. All right. We've had a few more questions come in just as we were doing that discussion. So I guess my uh, my 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 moment there worked. Um, Carol, do you want to uh, queue up the next one? Sure. Um, Stephen is asking, I've heard of a variety of different groups have been critical of Toronto's approach to the IZ formula. So that's inclusionary zoning. I really don't know the details around this, but can someone talk to this in some more detail? 
So that's a good um, you know, a, a good lead in, I guess, to two sides to every debate. And, and certainly there has um, been that ongoing push and pull about how you know, affordable housing measures end up uh, costing people that are trying to, to purchase real estate and, and making that side more expensive. Um, would uh, would you, Deanna, be able to, to dive into that for a moment and, and just clear some of that up? Yeah. And so, you know, certainly... I would say, I don't know that we found the sweet spot entirely, but we certainly, on both sides, we were hearing very passionate um, comments and feedback as part of the development of our inclusionary zoning policy. So sort of from um, a number of different stakeholders, they really felt like our inclusionary zoning policy doesn't go far enough, right? So when I talked about the amount of residential that would be dedicated to affordable housing, you know, if you compare it to housing now that Abby spoke about, it's considerably less. We're talking about, you know, 10% or less in the first few years, slowly ramping up to be a higher percentage over time. Um, so there was, I think, from from kind of that perspective of stakeholders, disappointment or criticism that we, we weren't using this tool, we weren't maximizing this tool to really tackle, you know, all the city's affordable housing challenges. The other perspective, and, and Marcus, you sort of touched on this, was really coming from the development industry and this suggestion that inclusionary zoning, you know, could stop housing supply or that it'll add on $65,000 to every new market unit. Um, and that's, again, where, I mean, we, we did incredible in-depth financial analysis to really make sure that land values could absorb this new requirement. So similar, you know, if you have a site that had a gas station on it, the developer has to pay less for that land because they know they have to remediate it. And inclusionary zoning is going to work the same way. It's going to mean that a developer is going to pay a bit less for that land, but the landowner is still motivated to, to sell the land and, and there's still going to be movement in the market. So a lot of the work we did and we sat down with the industry multiple times to make sure that we were all in agreement with the same assumption. Maybe we didn't have the same opinion at the end of the day, um, but we all agreed on the facts. And so, you know, what we brought before council was about balancing all of these different pieces and finding the policy that, you know, took into consideration all the sensitivities of the housing market and, and that we want to continue to support housing supply but we want to use this tool to really secure affordable housing. Um, so it, it was really taking into consideration a lot of those different pieces. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, can I just add one? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Abby, Abby no, you go on. Yeah. I was just going to say that um, one of the interesting things about inclusionary zoning, where you look elsewhere in the world where it's being done, um, you don't see inclusionary show up overnight. It's usually a policy that has been developed over at least a decade, if not longer. And I think one of the things which the City of Toronto's policy took into account was this need to start lower and increase over time. And one of the things that that does is it sends a clear signal that we want to get to a place which has a higher percentage, but not wanting to compromise or shock uh, the housing system or the land system to a point where people no longer sell, buy, develop their land. So it's it is a a legitimate compromise and one which has is does have comparisons with other cities around the world where you see their inclusionary policy develop perhaps more organically but over many decades. So I just wanted to make that point that I think in addition to getting the percentage right, the fact that it was over a period of time is also trying to uh, be practical and also ambitious as well. John? Yeah, I think you never want to shoot yourself in the foot by thinking that developers have, you know, unlimited deep pockets and you can get them to pay for anything and they'll still keep, uh, you'll still have people assembling property and building. However, and it's a big however, um, you know, in, in Willowdale, what I've observed is that the market is things are priced according to what the market is. And if people have to pay more in development charges or whatever, that's not what drives up prices. Prices will go up to wherever the market is. Similarly, and there are some real examples uh, to this in Willowdale that people should study. We had someone on Bayview who, while they were already under construction, got three additional floors. So that was all, 
you know, gravy to them. Did that, um, did they use any of that money to reduce the price of their units? No, they didn't. Um, at Young and Shepherd, we have somebody who's going to the OLT in the next month or so to uh, double the number of units. And, um, you know, is, is that going to make any of them more affordable than they would have been? They'll be more affordable because they'd be smaller. But, um, you know, comparing apples to apples, two units that are the same size in this building, uh, they're not, because they the developer had this windfall, they're not going to be reducing the cost of those units because they're making more money. They're just going to take the extra money. So, um, you know, they're, I think, uh, as Deanna and Abby said, I think the city has taken a pretty balanced approach to inclusionary zoning, probably more balanced than I would have taken given the windfall that developers in Willowdale have had. All right. And I'm going to take this as our, our final question, which is a follow up from from Steve, uh, going back to the, the question of engagement. How do you engage with the development industry on this topic? Uh, are there any success stories to share? Um, I may ask Abby or Deanna if they are, um, if any sort of thoughts come to mind on, on really successful engagements with developers in terms of, of delivering uh, unique projects in the city and then to John to speak about some more local examples. Um, well, I can maybe start with some of the success that we've had on the partnership side. Um, I, I think in in earlier in the discussion, I was trying to make clear that it had to be an all of government approach. I think actually some of the most successful projects and outcomes come when you have government along with uh, the for profit development community and also the non profit development community as well. And we've seen um, for profit developers also in some cases recognize the importance of affordable housing and include it in projects, taking advantage of some of the incentive programs that the city offers. Um, and it's through um, discussions like that, they're, they're often um, less, they're not as adversarial as you might think, actually. And, and there are many private developers in the city who, um, not on every project, but who do kind of identify sites and, and forge partnerships on site so that they can take advantage of those incentives. Um, and it's good to see that happening and certainly the city will you know maintain our incentive program um, and so that it can align with the other levels of government who are also offering kind of housing programs as well and ideally some of the most exciting projects would be where you see all of that stacked on top of each other uh, in a unique way to to deliver the right kind of affordability in various different locations across the city. Deanna, any thoughts before going to John? Yeah, I would just, I mean, it sort of kind of goes back to where residents have been, you know, really instrumental in, in advocating for affordable housing. But I can think of two relatively recent negotiations where we were able to layer on the incentives that Abby's talking about. So one in the, the Agent Court Mall and one at Duffer Mall. So our mall sites in the city are, are really right for, for this type of partnership. Um, and I think it was about bringing all of these different parties together. Um, so, you know, I think if if we didn't have kind of pushed from everyone, we wouldn't have had as, success, as successful as a outcome as we did. And the ability to layer on what's called the, the city's open door program, so that has that suite of incentives, means that we can essentially get more out of that overall affordable housing benefit. I also see in the chat that Stephen had asked about the 99 years and just really briefly, you know, that's where generally speaking, as much as possible, we're trying to make sure that when we're securing new affordable housing, we're really extending that affordability period. Um, we know that, you know, maybe years ago we would secure new affordable housing for 15 years or 20 years. And in someone's, you know, career that that is gone. So, um, you know, as part of all of these discussions with residents and so on, we've really heard that as the number one priority. And that's that's been prioritized as a part of a lot of these affordable housing deals. And John, any uh, any local observations on uh, Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't work quite as well here. There are some terrific developers in the city um, who, you know, want to make a 
a decent profit, but also leave something good behind. And I have tried uh, many times to lure some of them to pick up properties in Willowdale. In some cases, they've attempted to, but have been outbid by, um, frankly, uh, in many cases, land speculators that we we don't have the same kind of old school builders, uh, developers in Willowdale that we used to have. Um, we have people who assemble property and uh, get the property up zoned and then flip it to somebody else. And um, it's often, you know, it, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a money thing. And, and um, um, some of the more traditional developers, um, you know, don't want to get caught in those bidding wars or aren't willing to pay the amounts that um, some of the speculators are. And um, so it's hard to get them up here. I just have not had any luck, especially in the last two years where I just have a, so much less leverage because of the change in the planning rules. There was one site that would have been terrific location for affordable housing. And I spoke to Abby about it. I kept trying to steer the property owner and saying, there's incentives, there's, you know, why don't you check into it? Maybe you can make more money doing it that way. And they just weren't even interested in making the phone call. And um, other sites, very large sites where I can't get a stick of affordable housing, they just say, no, we're not interested and you can't make us. And uh, the sad fact is I can't. And uh, thus the importance, perhaps, of more inclusionary zoning policies coming online. Um, Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to give you each an opportunity just to uh, share some closing thoughts as we wrap things up tonight. Um, we'll go in reverse order, perhaps. Uh, so, Deanna, if you have any closing thoughts you want to share with the, the crowd tonight. Yeah, really just thank you for your time. It's It's always a great opportunity to talk about affordable housing and that intersection with city planning, um, you know, it's certainly something that I'm passionate about. And I am I think, you know, part of the reason I love living in Toronto is just the diversity of households and that my neighbours, you know, can have a totally different income or background or, or what have you. And so I really think, you know, a lot of the work we're doing is about maintaining that diversity, maintaining that integration. And, um, and continuing to build on past successes. So I guess that's my hope for the future that, you know, to, to everyone's comments that our kids can afford to live in the city, but also that newcomers can afford to live in the city and, and that we're continuing to bring in a whole host of, of different folks to live together. All right, thanks, Deanna. And Abby. Yeah, I'll leave you with, um you know, not necessarily a fun or uplifting fact, but um, there was the Toronto Board of Trade report recently that highlighted the potential cost of not taking enough action on affordable housing. And they estimated the cost of that were to be about $8 billion to the region over the next 10 years. And so I think we're starting to see it, you know, uh, it's the cost of people um, upward pressure on wages right, inflationary costs, upward pressure on wages, migration, people moving out of the city to live somewhere else, uh, productivity uh, loss from the long commutes that people will then have. So these are all things which are going to start to happen. It's almost like the housing crisis is reshaping our economy and reshaping the way that we live without us. The status quo is changing us. So I think um, I would just leave you with the thought that actually action through action on affordable housing, we're able to shape the city uh, in a much better way. Thank you for the opportunity this evening. Thanks, Abby. And, and John? Oh, I think Deanna and uh, Abby just summed it up so well. And uh, <laughs> really, I, I have nothing more to say other than uh, this really is everybody's problem. And uh, I hope people will come to realize that very soon. 
Well, I, I think it uh, it speaks volumes that uh, our, our, our politician here is uh, lost for words after hearing uh, Deanna and Abby's closing. Uh, we really have been fortunate tonight to have uh, two incredibly accomplished panelists joining us in Willowdale, uh, talking about all of these uh, various city programs that are going on. You know, I know from my perspective, sometimes it feels overwhelming that we've got so much work to do uh, to to tackle this this housing affordability issue that just seems to be growing uh, day by day and at the same time when we talk through what's happening tonight um, you know we start to get a sense of the immense amount of work that the city of Toronto has been doing uh, under the leadership of uh, of our panelists tonight um, so thank you so much for for all your hard work and efforts I, I know that's going to continue um, we really appreciate you giving up your your evening to join us to to help educate our community a little bit more on on what's happening um, and what will continue to happen over the next little while. Um, shout out, uh, I did see one question come in from, from Jane Garson just at the end, uh, asking about uh, basement apartments and, and granny flats. Uh, and, and Jane, I hope you'll allow me to, to use that as a teaser for uh, the third in our Let's Talk Willowdale series, which is coming on Thursday night at 7.30, uh, which is going to be on some of the proposed changes to single family neighborhoods that are going to be coming back uh, to City Council um, late this spring, early summer. Um, so there have already been some changes around laneway suites and, and garden suites, um, and now talk about uh, duplex and, and triplex housing. So uh, we've separated those conversations, and, and we'll be doing a separate session on Thursday with John uh, and some other guests to talk more about how to make that work um, and uh, how to integrate different forms of housing into our, our single-family neighbourhoods. Uh, beyond what we've talked about tonight. So we hope you'll be back uh, on Thursday night to, to join us again. Of course, unless you're watching this uh, as a recording uh, at some future point. But uh, thanks to our audience uh, for being with us tonight. And thank you to John and uh, all of my colleagues in John's office for helping to make this possible. It's been a great pleasure to talk about this issue with all of you tonight. And, and we'll look forward to continuing the conversation soon. Good night, everybody.